Okay, hi there, welcome to a macro video. We're going to focus today on the exchange rate as part of our revision for 2021. A teacher friend and colleague of mine from Australia posted a great question on social media a couple of days back. The exchange rate, is this the key variable in a global economy? And this got me thinking about the significance, the importance of the exchange rate to all kinds of different macroeconomic variables. And I wanted to share with you a few thoughts with you as part of, of my revision for my own students. The exchange, exchange rate, of course, is simply the price of one currency measured in terms of another. What, what another, uh, in term, how much of another currency an exchange rate will buy. In other words, it's the purchasing power of one currency against another. And currencies are traded in the global market, from euro sterling to the euro dollar to the dollar yuan, etc. By these are bilateral exchange rates, the value of one currency against another. Turnover, the daily turnover in foreign exchange markets is absolutely vast. It is huge. Just in 2019, over $6.5 trillion worth of currencies traded globally every day. Absolutely phenomenally high. Vast trading platforms, much of which is speculative. Quite a bit is linked with trade, obviously, and also other financial and portfolio flows. And there are something like $12 trillion worth of foreign global currency reserves. Lots of countries countries hold FX or foreign exchange reserves, perhaps as part of their policy. If you're revising your year 13 economics, exchange rate systems are important. You can make a case for saying that the exchange rate system that a country chooses to operate is one of the most important decisions vis-a-vis uh, -vis macroeconomic policy. Essentially, four main systems you need to know about. The free floating currency, the managed float, the semi-fixed currency, known as the crawling peg, and also the fully fixed exchange rate, a hard peg. Well, with a floating exchange rate, there's no target for the exchange rate. There's no need for central bank intervention. The market determines the value of the exchange rate, and countries don't necessarily need to have large foreign exchange reserves. Whereas with a managed floating currency, well, possibly the exchange rate could figure as an objective of policy on occasions, and that might necessitate intervention by a central bank, including direct buying and selling of a currency and also changing of interest rates. So in that sense, if you're moving towards a managed float, then many countries in that situation will need to have foreign exchange reserves as part of their intervention toolbox. Semi-fixed currency is taking us towards currency pegs, and this is where currency can move day to day pretty freely, but within set bands of fluctuation. And the central bank must intervene if the currency moves outside the prescribed limits. Crucially, FX reserves, currency reserves must be used as part of intervention, and interest rates, of course, have to be set to help stabilise the exchange rate. With a fully fixed currency, the currency is an explicit target of monetary and macroeconomic policy. The currency is essentially fixed against one or more currencies. Intervention is needed to maintain the official currency peg and foreign exchange reserves will be needed in part for that purpose. I'm hinting at the bottom here that please make sure that you have at least one example of a country for each currency system. Countries that have fixed exchange rates include Hong Kong, Qatar and Saudi Arabia who are fixed to the dollar. Bulgaria, Denmark and Senegal have fixed to the euro. Kuwait and Nepal uh, have a fix, but against a composite of, of currencies, not just one. Jamaica, Croatia, China and Ethiopia are essentially countries that have a semi-fixed exchange rate system. They, they control by how much the currency can move on a day-to-day -day basis. And then a whole cluster of countries, Kenya, Ukraine, South Korea, India, etc., South Africa, Sweden, Turkey, Mexico, that essentially have a managed floating currency. Now, that doesn't mean the central bank is intervening every, every day, but it does mean that on occasions the central bank will try to manage the external value of a currency, either move it up, appreciation, or move it down, depreciation. And there are countries with a free floating exchange rate. Australia, Canada, Norway, the UK... United States and the Eurozone have a free floating exchange rate. The markets set the currency's value. Although people often tell me, and they're right, central banks understand that their monetary policy decisions will have a bearing on the exchange rate, but it's not explicitly part of monetary policy. So to go back to my friend's question, it's a really, really interesting question, one that invited hopefully a response from me. Why is a change 
in the external value of a currency important for one or more macro objectives. I'm going to focus on six with you. Again, I'm sure there are many more, but I wanted to wanted to isolate some some important themes from an, uh, from a revision point of view. First one, of course, is the obvious, I guess, the obvious point that currency movements up and down, depreciation, appreciation, they can affect the relative price of exports and imports. A country's goods and services sold overseas and the things we have to import. So the exchange rate can impact directly on the price competitiveness of exports, for example. If the pound falls against the dollar, in theory, exports will rise with a time lag and that might feed through to the net trade balance. I'm sure you're revising things like the J curve and the Marshall Lerner condition better to understand the impact of currency movements on the trade balance. So there's a trade effect. A second reason why currencies are important is because of the link between the currency and inflation. You see changes in the exchange rate, and this is a key analysis as well as, as, well as an evaluation point. Changes in the exchange rate can affect both demand pull and cost push inflationary pressures. I'll give you an example of that in just a second. Actually, let's do it now. Let's go back to our old friend ADAS analysis. So if a currency depreciates, other things being the same, Keteris Paribus, that means that uh, exports should become cheaper overseas and you'd expect an increase in the sale of exports and uh, imports become more expensive. So if the trade balance improves, if there's a net injection of export demand into the economy, then that should lead to an outward shift of aggregate demand and national income can increase from Y1 to Y3. I've put in a cheeky Y3 there on the diagram. I think the reason is because, and many students forget this, a change in the exchange rate also can cause a shift in aggregate supply in the short term. You see a fall in the currency leads to a rise in import prices, the price of energy, fuel, copper, whatever it is, raw materials, and that can also cause an inward shift of aggregate supply. So uh, really quite important to understand that currencies do affect inflation, they do affect aggregate demand, they affect uh, economic growth and inflationary pressure in the short term. Quite important. A third, and, and now we're getting into some quite interesting areas. The third significance of currencies is that they do affect monetary policy decisions. If you're running a managed floating currency, if you've got a, if the exchange rate is a target of policy, then monetary policy is not independent of the exchange rate. You see, for example, if you want your currency to appreciate, you might have to have a period of relatively high interest rates uh, to try to attract hot money. So countries that have managed or semi-fixed exchange rates, the monetary policy decisions, in particular the interest rate decisions, have to be partly linked to or geared to what they, what they want to happen to the exchange rate. Keep in mind also with point three that the policy of quantitative easing or QE also has an effect on the exchange rate and we discussed that in a separate video on our channel. And then point four, currencies can also affect the, if you like, the real value, the purchasing power that country gets and people get from, from external assets overseas and the, the converted value of the interest, the profits, the dividends from those assets and also remittance flows. If, for example, uh, people are sending money home in the form of dollars to a country uh, and, and that country's currency falls against the dollar, then the purchasing power of those remittance incomes goes up. It can be quite a big stimulus to domestic demand. Likewise, the profits and the dividends, if they're priced in dollars, uh, you convert to your home currency to find that purchasing power. Point five, currency volatility and implied investor risk. So the exchange rate for many countries is quite volatile. We often see quite big swings and movements in exchange rates. Just a couple of days ago, the Turkish lira, I think, depreciated by about 13 to 15 percent. Lots of currencies are quite volatile and that can have an impact on the, the risk of investments. Um, if, for example, it might impact on FDI flows if you know that currencies are volatile. If you're a bond investor and the currency is weak and volatile, that might implicate have implications Sorry for the yield you expect to get to cover that risk uh, on new issues of government bonds. 
countries with fairly stable exchange rates, relatively stable, and let's say relatively low inflation and good policy, well, they get the benefit of cheaper bond yields, which makes it easier and cheaper for the government to borrow. My final point, I think, is probably my most important one. I just want to spend a second or two on this. In a world where in many countries the base rate of interest has fallen close to zero, the so-called lower bound for nominal interest rates, then the exchange rate can become a useful, important tool of instrument of macro policy. Uh, you see, central banks may not have particularly much room to, to move their interest rates uh, up or down a little bit. Let's say, for example, they want to cut interest rates. Well, in the case of the UK, base rates are 0.1%. You might consider negative interest rates, but essentially you can't move interest rates far from where they are at the moment in a downwards direction. So that essentially puts a little bit of a constraint on monetary policy. And uh, I mean, in theory, the UK central bank could try to manage sterling. It doesn't, but they could try to manage the value of sterling. Let's say, for example, uh, if this is, wasn't the UK, but let's say the UK uh, engineered a 10% depreciation of sterling through a big rise in QE, etc., or perhaps even some central bank buying and selling of currencies. 10% change in the exchange rate would probably be the equivalent of, let's say, 2% change in interest rates as a rough rule of thumb. What am I saying? In a world where interest rates are fairly low with not much room to move, the exchange rate can become quite an important macroeconomic variable and it's perhaps one reason why more countries seem to be moving towards managed floating exchange rates as a as a monetary as part of their monetary policy and uh, managed floating if you apply a bit of game theory suggests that countries might be if you like del deliberately trying to just bring their currency down to improve their competitiveness to uh, to increase market share of their leading export sectors well, if one currency goes down, another one goes up. So clearly there's a risk there of currency wars. Well, there we go. This little video, hope you enjoyed it, was uh, prompted by this question. The exchange rate, is this the key variable in the global economy? It's a great question. And it, uh, I think it invites the thought that if you revise exchange rates and exchange rate systems, you'll have plenty to talk about in your macroeconomic assessments. Take care and see you soon.